I'm saying, somebody said you cut too. Get sleep. I'm just saying. Just for okay, that was that was free. Matthew, Matthew chapter four. Matthew chapter four, verse number three and verse number four. Just drop a few nuggets with you. I don't know what kind of week you're going to have. Neither do you. Amen. And it's funny. It's some of our motivation. We say, you know, have a good week anyway. But I don't believe in the unrealistic optimism that says you never have a bad day. I think every now and then you need to have a bad day. And the reason why you need to have a bad day every now and then is so that you'll appreciate and be able to distinguish the difference between a good day and a bad day. If all your days were good, then really none of them are good. They just are. But you need to, you need to know the difference between God is, when God is relieving the pressure yeah. of pressure. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Uh, you know, you know uh, people get really religious and things, and, and they say, well, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not. when the doctor gives a good report, they say, look, praise God. And when the doctor gives a bad report, they say, oh, no, I'm not claiming that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I don't trust doctors. I trust God. So you don't trust doctors when they give you bad news. Right? But when they give you good news, you give God the glory for the news the doctor gave you. The reality is, with any kind of news, God is in control. And sometimes he wants you to hear bad news so that your head hangs low, so that he can reintroduce himself to you as the lifter up of your head. Right? You don't know him as a healer if you're never sick. If you've never been sick, you have not, you might have, you guess what, you've met Jehovah Jireh, but you have not met Jehovah Rapha if you've never been sick. If you've never been broke, you might know Jehovah Rapha because you were sick and he made you well, but you have never met Jehovah Jireh if you've never been in a position where he had to provide for you. And God has been showing historically it, and through all of his efforts and through all of his miracles and through all of his dealings with his people, he's not just showing him one, himself one dimensionally. He's trying to show his people that whatever it is you need, I am everything you need. And the only way some of us ever get to the point of knowing that God is all we need is when God is all we have. So he allows that. We're going to talk about this this morning, uh, this afternoon. Look what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 4, beginning with verse number 3. The Bible says, and we're familiar with this passage of Scripture, Jesus, uh, after being baptized in the River Jordan by John, uh, he's taken, led of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And the Bible says that Jesus, that the tempter came to him in verse number 3, and he said, If thou be the Son of God, Command that these stones be made bread. Now, Jesus had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. Is that right? You yeah. understand? You remember that? This means for 40 days and 40 nights he didn't eat, so he was hungry. The Bible says that in verse number 2. Afterward, he was hungry. His body was subjected to the pains of being hungry. And so, quite naturally, the first temptation that the enemy presented before him was a temptation to satisfy his immediate need. The temptation of instant gratification through the abuse of power. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The temptation of instant gratification through the abuse of or the misuse of, of his power. Mm -hmm. So he says, if you be the son of God, why don't you command these stones to be made bread? Now look what Jesus says to him. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, mm -hmm. but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. And that's what I want to talk about. Man shall not live by bread alone. But I don't want to talk about it from a traditional sense where we read this and we enjoy it without uh, really fully knowing the depth of where it comes from. See, we say, man, man, Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone. But why was that so significant? One, it was significant because Jesus was quoting something that had already been established. So, so, so if you have no idea of what he's quoting, you can't fully understand what he means by quoting it. He's quoting something that was already written. Jesus did not say this. This is not, this is one of the few times where Jesus is not simply the word, but the word is quoting the word. 
Are you understanding this? So he says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word uh, that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. But, but, but he prefaces saying that by saying it is written. Mm -hmm. Now to fully understand what Jesus is talking about, it may behoove us as students of the word of God to go to the place where it is written. Mm -hmm. That's right. Understand the context under which it is written. Understand who it was written to. Understand what they were going through paralleling what they were going through to what Jesus is going through and then gathering the fragments of understanding of what Jesus means by quoting this text at this pivotal point in his temptation. Okay, that sounds like a lot, but it's really simple. Let me, let me invite you to Deuteronomy chapter 8. It's really simple. Jesus quotes this particular scripture when the devil says, if you be the son of God, why don't you use your power to command these stones to be made bread. Now, the, the issue with this is, there would, have been, would, would there have been anything wrong with Jesus turning stone into bread if he was hungry? Absolutely not. Did Jesus have the power to turn stones into bread? Absolutely. Then why wouldn't Jesus seize this opportunity to feed himself? Because that opportunity was by the suggestion of an enemy that wanted him to take advantage of that opportunity, not simply to feed himself, but to prove himself. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And he did not live his life seeking to prove himself to the very enemy who already knew who he was. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Now watch this. Watch this. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Y'all ready for this? Turn to somebody and say, wake up. It won't be long. My wife over here screaming, nugget, nugget. Y'all know it won't be long if the wife is screaming at me. Uh. All right, Deuteronomy chapter 8. Now, watch this. And then we're going to have to go, go a little deeper. Deuteronomy chapter 8, let's begin with verse number 1. Read it. Let's look at it briefly. It says, oh, this is when the children of Israel came, uh, were coming coming through and getting close to the point of coming out of the wilderness, God, God gives these words to them. All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do, that ye may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. God is prepping them for the promised land. Yeah. Okay, he's prepping them for the promised land. And what he's doing to prepare them for the promised land is establishing what he did in the wilderness so that they'd be prepared for the promised land. Okay, watch what he says. And thou shalt remember. That's how he's established. I want you to remember. Don't get to the promised land and think you got there by yourself and forget who got you through the wilderness. He says, I remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness. Now watch this. The first point is, God says, I'm doing this to low you. Yeah. I want to low you. I did this to low you. Because you can't start high and go higher. you got to start low. Yeah. He says, to humble thee. Watch this. I, I did it to no, low you. Watch this. To humble thee and to prove uh, thee to what? To know what was in thine heart. So he did it to low them and he did it to know them. Okay? Now, now watch these principles because they're not just for Deuteronomy. They're just not for Matthew 4. They're for us today. Now let me help you understand what he means by know. Because an omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient God knows everything. The only way for God, this word know, is not to be informed. That's not what God is talking about. What this word know, it's the word yada. It means to experience. A God who knows everything has to subject himself to experience anything. You understand what I'm saying? Because he already knows. So what God does is he, he, he subjects himself to a lower form of godness just so that he can have an experience. Because a God who knows everything couldn't experience anything. So what God had to do is he had to become something so that he can experience something. Now, now, now he did this in the Old Testament spiritually. But when we get to the New Testament, he does it literally because God actually had to step down and become a man so that he can experience, so that he can yada. 
so that he can know. Now, did God know before he sent Jesus? Yes, he knows everything. But in order for a God who knows everything to have a human experience, he had to become human. Are you with me? Let's stay with me. Watch this. So he did it to loathe them. He did it to know them. But watch this. He says, to know what was in thy heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or so. Then he says, and he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger. Now here it is. Suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with what? Yeah. Now you got to watch this. Now the children of Israel, now he fed thee with manna. Let me just read this. I'm moving fast. Fed thee with manna, which what? Thou what? No, no, no. Knewest not. Neither did what? Your ancestors. Now, I need you to understand this. Now, this is where it gets a little tricky. Okay. Manna was what they referred to later as bread. But it wasn't bread. It wasn't bread. Okay. Now, go to, now, now we got to dig deeper. Can, can we go a little deeper? Go to Exodus 16. It wasn't bread. If it was bread, then God wouldn't have said that you knew not or your fathers knew. Their forefathers knew what bread tasted like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. God didn't feed them with bread. Okay? Now they called it bread, right? But it wasn't bread. Kind of like you call the inward parts of a watermelon meat. Y'all do that? Y'all call the inside of the watermelon meat? Right? If it's a yellow meat, a yellow watermelon, you call it yellow meat watermelon. But ain't nothing meaty about this. It's not meat. It's not meat. It's not the same texture, but you call it meat by virtue of it serving the same purpose or, or being in a likeness of, right? Watch Exodus 16. Y'all got to go. Right? Y'all got to go. Y'all got to see this. Okay? And then you say, what does this have to do with us? Just stay on the boat. Don't stay on the boat. Stay on the bus. Don't get off before you stop. All right? Watch Exodus 16. And I'm almost done. Exodus 16, verse number, let's look at verse number 12. The Bible says, I have heard the murmurings of the children. Now, this is a reference to what he's talking about in Deuteronomy 8. Mm -hmm. He says, I fed them with manna. Watch this. I've heard the murmurings of the children of Israel. Speak unto them, saying, At even ye shall eat flesh in the morning, and ye shall be filled with bread, and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God. And it came to pass that at even the quails came up and covered uh, the camp in the morning. Uh, the dew lay round about the host. Now, watch this. And when the dew that lay was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness there lay a small, round thing. Now, they had seen bread before. But this was a small, round thing as the hoarfrost on the ground. Watch verse 15. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, It is manna, for they wist not what it was. The very word manna means what is it? Manna. <laughs> manna by definition means what is it? They called it manna because they did not know what it was. They ate bread before. The Passover that they ate before they left Egypt included unleavened bread. They seen bread before. But this thing this thing, when they got hungry in the wilderness, this thing that was on the ground in the morning with the frost on it and laying on the ground, a round, small thing, they, they did not know what it was. And since they did not know what it was, they called it manna because manna means what is it? <laughs> now you say, what does that have to do with anything? Back in Deuteronomy chapter 8, what he says is, I fed you with manna. The reason why God is saying, the reason why I fed you with manna is so that you know that man does not live by what? Yeah. Now get this, get this, get this, get this. This is awesome, and I'm almost done. He said, the reason why I fed you with something that you had no idea of what it was is so that you understand that I'm not limited to bread when it comes to feeding you. Woo! 